Welcome to another episode of The Opportunity Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Elfring, the head of marketing over here at Empire Flippers. And today I'm talking to a very old and dear friend of mine, Ronnie Tasia, who I've had the honor of watching him explode on the e-commerce scene over the last few years. He's built from one brand all the way up to 15 different e-commerce stores and not just Amazon FBA stuff. We're talking about DDC, which a lot of people struggle with growing multiple brands in the DDC space. But Ronnie has really mastered it down to almost like a formula, if you will. I've known Ronnie for so long. He's a really good guy. And this episode is fantastic. We talk about perseverance. We talk about his background from immigrants in India to Canada, how he lived in a $500 a month basement to now he's traveling the world. He's speaking at all the events that I go to, all the all the events with some of the biggest marketers in the world, which now Ronnie is one of them. And now he's become an aggregator of DDC brands. So if you are curious on how can you get more done, how can you delegate and run as many brands as say as Ronnie is doing, then this is a good podcast episode for you. And you might be kicking yourself when you hear some of his answers on how he delegates because it seems so devilishly simple. But I am telling you, this works. Ronnie is proof, but I also have tons of other entrepreneur friends that are doing very similar stuff as Ronnie. So I hope you enjoyed the episode and I will see you on the other side. And by the way, if you do enjoy the episode, if you're watching this on YouTube, why not subscribe to us? Or if you're listening to this in a podcast app, we would love it if you review or share the episode. It helps us out a ton. All right. With that said, I'll stop talking and I'll see you on the other side. Bye. All right. I got my good friend, Ronnie Teja here. Welcome to the podcast, my friend. I am kind of shocked we haven't done this before, considering all the stuff you've done and we're always at events together. But for our audience who may not know you, give us a lowdown of who you are, what you're up to, and where you're at in the world right now. Yeah, my name is Ronnie Teja. I'm in e-commerce. I run a portfolio of about 15 different e-com companies. And I am in Kaulak, Thailand, on the way to Koh Samui, which is going to be my new home. So between Bangkok and Koh Samui in Thailand, I'm from India. Grew up in India, moved to Canada as an immigrant when I was 21, 22. And then from Vancouver, came down to Bangkok. Thanks for having me, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to have you, Ronnie. Yeah. Hey, tell me how you got, how, how did you get into e-commerce? Like, so you moved over to Canada. Yeah. What inspired you? Like, how did this happen? How did your e-commerce journey start? Yeah, look, it's quite interesting overall, right? It's there's three things that happen when you immigrate as an adult. Number one, your life completely changes. So we went from living in a house in India when we from having a decent middle class background to living in somebody's basement, a family of four for about, you know, five hundred dollars a month. First big shock, right? Second big shock, money becomes extremely important. So rupees to dollars is not really a good exchange rate. So, you know, when you're always converting, so we had to sell everything that we had there to move to Canada. And that's when, like, you know, this sort of urgency to make money as quickly as possible, right? The second thing, yeah. The most important thing is number three is, like, the cultural nuances are extremely difficult. So if you grew up in Asia and then you end up in Canada, you know, it's like, it's completely different. In India, when you're growing up, your parents decide your life for you, including the partner that you're going to marry, for example, arranged marriages, right? In Canada or the U.S., you're given the freedom of thought. You're given the freedom to choose and to do whatever you want. So, like, when I landed in Canada... And this is, you know, where a preface everything was. I was like, I can do anything I want. I can literally study anything I want. And I was, you know, I was on YouTube and I was like, that's how I got started in Nikon, man. It's like I literally watched a YouTube video of somebody basically being like, you know, this is e-commerce, this is the advent of e-commerce, and this is what you should try and get into. And I was like, holy shit, this is how it could work out. And that's how I taught myself. I literally went through the whole Google ads when they launched the first product, the marketing school. That's how I learned my AdWords. And then I... Went to work for a couple of companies, HSBC, then Best Buy, then a couple of other ones. And then I said, look, I'm making all these guys as a media buyer so much money. Why am I not like doing something for myself? So quite <laughs> interestingly, I said, what? Now, this is the interesting part. I said, what is going to make me the most amount of money? And, then I, and I didn't have any market research. I'll be honest. I was just like a little finger in the wind and seeing like what actually works. And somehow I was reading this magazine and it basically said, Quartz watches have a 70% margin on them. And then I got contacted a couple of guys in Hong Kong and I said, hey man, do you manufacture quartz watches? They're like, yeah, you know, this is how you do it, blah, blah, blah. They're like, have you, do you know anything about watches? I'm like, no, I don't know anything about watches. I'm like, but I surely know they're profitable. So, 
<laughs> so that's how I got started. I literally got started because it was literally like, you know, it's like kind of one of those Dr. Doolittle moments where you open a book and you like, you know, put a pin in and you figure out what niche you're going to be in. And, you know, at the end of the day, you end up in Hong Kong, you know, at the World Watch and Clock Fair and you basically go to see each and every vendor 10 times over and people, and if I told you the story, it's sort of a, you know, like a playbook, it's some sort of a movie, right? It's like, I went to this Watch and Clock Fair every damn day, you know, the person who was hosting me was my friend from Vancouver, King Kai, right? I said, I'm coming over for two days. And I stayed with him for like one month. <laughs> and, and, same, same. <laughs> yeah, same, same, right? And he was too polite to say anything to me. He ate his food, drank his beers every day, not a problem. <laughs> then I met this other guy, you know, who's to be my future watch supplier, like my main factory. And he says, why don't you see our manufacturing operations in Shenzhen? So you can learn a little more about watches than you know. And I invited myself over for two days and ended up staying with him for two months. So, <laughs> the two so whatever special. you do, people, yeah, people who listen to this podcast or Greg himself, please do not invite me to your house to stay over for one day. You know, there's a recurring trend here. <laughs> but, you know, long story short, you know, uh, I'm sorry if I'm rambling, but it's interesting, right? It's like I had never had somebody take a chance on me. Like this gentleman who was in Shenzhen, my friend who was in Hong Kong, like they're all a part of my journey. And it's always like one of those things when I look back, even yourself, Greg, right? And the Empire Flippers crew, it's like at different stages of my life, I've met some amazing people, right? I think for what? We've known each other for 10 years. We don't know what we did. You knew I was in e-commerce. I knew you worked for Empire Flippers. But that was it. It's like, it's one of those things. Like sometimes it just, you know, you just meet people and somehow things happen. And that's what I always believe in. It's like right time, right place. Things are meant to happen. Yeah, Sorry it's cool, man. No, no, I loved it. I think it's cool that your market research was just kind of like dart on the wall. Like, I have no idea what this is. And you just like go for it. Yeah. But to your other point, like meeting people, like, yeah, I mean, I've met so many entrepreneurial friends that like we've become very good friends and I only know a little bit of their business, right? So that's why I was shocked when I heard like, because you've been making the rounds lately in terms of speeches and stuff like that. And I, I had no idea like, what is it, 15 e-commerce brands, something like that? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, I don't know. I'm an aggregator. I run about a portfolio for about 15 different brands, yes. Yeah, that, that's Still small, huge. And but can it, be bigger. <laughs> yeah, well, it always can be bigger, but that is awesome. And, and also, just it's cool to see people after so much time in the industry now, <laughs> seeing all these entrepreneurs I'm friends with, like, grow into doing some really big stuff. Like, seeing you on stage is, like, it's really cool. Like, I knew Roddy back when he was big. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was pretty big. I was, I was pretty fat. <laughs> Back in the day. <laughs> yeah. yeah Ron, so, cool. so for those yeah, for those who don't know, Ronnie 1.0 used to weigh about 125 <laughs> kilos. <laughs> he was yeah, a pretty fat just, fuck. <laughs> yeah, you're one of the guys, you know, is my inspiration for my own health and fitness that I'm trying to <laughs> scramble together a routine with. So <laughs> it's awesome just to see all the growth you've done. I want to get into the 15 sure. e-commerce brands, because I think something that would be really interested, interesting for our audience mm -hmm. is just how you manage them all together. But before we do, I want to isolate Bronzio, your watches yep. brand. So that was your first yes, brand. And you yep. faced some uphill battles as you were building it, maybe because of the market research that you did. But talk me through yeah. the battles that you did face as you were growing Bronzio and how you overcame them. Like, what were some of the big pivotal moments? Sure. Like, number one, my feedback today is please don't throw a dart on the wall and choose your niche. <laughs> do not do my research. <laughs> do not do my research. I mean, you know, this was 2013. So things have a way of working out and I got lucky. But look, there's a few things, right? It's like challenges, threefold. Number one, although ads were cheap, the ad washing machine was pretty cheap. The mistakes I made were on the product side, right? Number one was I didn't have enough startup capital. The startup capital that I had for ads, it was about $10,000. And the startup capital that I had for the product itself was zero. So I was at, so that's why I always talk about this watch supplier who I went to stay for two months. He took a chance on me. He gave me about fifty dollars or $100,000 of line and credit. And he says, wow. I know who you are. You will pay me back. Even if you fail, I have a good feeling about you. So he gave me that money and he says, take this what, Did he also so, give you the 100K? Because like this, it will help you leave, like get out of my place. <laughs> I think it was one of those things. He's like, he's please, like please. this man, he's like, literally, this man is so fat. He's going to eat enough food to, to outrun us for the next two months. So he says, take this line of credit and get out of my house before you eat me under the table. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah. I mean, look, on a serious note, it's one of those things, right? It's like at some point of time, 
you meet people and this goes back to being a connector, or, you know, whatever you associate with, right? In my case, I know I'm a connector. It was the right time, the right place and somebody who wanted to go out of the way to take a chance on me, right? So success comes from that. Success came from choosing a niche that was relatively young, right? Quartz watches, watches in the market, not as big, focused on that and it worked out. Facebook ads, getting on Facebook ads and influences before everybody else was. So riding that wave of e-com definitely worked out. Challenges was getting banned by Google, by Facebook. You know, everybody's been through that. So I think about three years into our business, we were making, I think by that point in time, we were doing about two, three million dollars a year in revenue. And I think I had about 20, 25 employees and 10 of them were based in Vancouver. So it wasn't the remote company that I had today. Back then, I mean, if 10 of your employees are based in Vancouver, that's about, you know, $600,000 of just US Vancouver based payroll. So pretty heavy plus a WeWork yeah. office, you know, another hundred grand. So I mean, like, you know, if you're doing three mil and all of a sudden all these accounts are banned, so you've lost a third, you literally lost, you know, a third of your revenue source and you're like, holy hell, what do I do now? So first mistake definitely I can share with you is I decided to be the, the, you know, the awesome, the mad lad, alpha founder. It's like, I'm going down with the ship, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Things not to do. Things I would recommend you not to do because from my experience, if I have anything to go with, if by any chance things like that happen, slice and dice your business by half, like literally just clean out as quickly as possible because it will take a while to get things back to normal. So yeah, stuff like that. Employees leaving, employees trying to copy my business, employees think they can, who can do it better. I mean, I think I've been through such a roller coaster and I think maybe it's the 10,000 hours or 10 years. It's been 10 years since business. It's kind of weird because I started in January, 2013. So it's, it is 10 years. So ah, happy say, <laughs> yeah, thanks man. Like it's like, I did say like, it's one of those things where things phase me, but they phase me a lot less. Right, that roller coaster journey still exists. It happens, but the small stuff in business don't matter as much as, you know, the big stuff. So, like COVID, for yeah. example, right? Like when COVID happened, it was interesting. The first thing I did, what I was talking to you about, was cut all my expenses. I literally cut yeah. all my expenses, all my SaaS, all my agencies, everything that I had was renegotiated by about fifty percent. And I said, look, and I was honest, and with my vendors, I said, we've been partners for five years. I don't know what's coming, right? You don't know what's coming, but this is the time I have to go to you and ask for this, the deep discount. Somehow it worked out. We did well. And of course, my SaaS vendors probably hate me for the discount that I got from them. <laughs> however, I think it's, however, you know, I mean, being proactive about certain things is important. Like every year we look at our books and we see where we can cut costs. You know, every three months we change a credit card on SaaS costs because, you know, sometimes we forget about that 599 subscription. No, oh, there's uh, so many things like that. Like even for yeah. us, like with the whole accounting team reminding us of these subscription payments, we still miss things that are like, what is yeah, this? Yeah. This is like two years literally ago. Literally just change like, the card, man. Yeah, yeah. Literally just change the card. <laughs> I have like a virtual card for that reason. It's set to expire every three months and just refresh. So you just Oh, that's smart. It. That's smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but so there's a lot of people in the e-commerce world that they want to do what you've done, but they fail. You've been through a lot That's of ups great. and downs. Like you were talking about like losing a third of your income. I feel like most of my really good entrepreneur friends like you, like there's always one day where something just totally gut punches their business and it sounds like you've been through a few. So what's like the common theme? And I think you might've already mentioned it, but what's been the common theme that you think has made you not fail, allow you to continue to not just succeed, uh, but really expand like through all these battles? Well, two qualities I would say. Number one is when you talk about perseverance. <clears throat> People who basically think determination is going to get you through the wall are sadly mistaken. I mean, I hate to put it this way, man. It's like, if I were to be extremely honest with you, it's like, I've been sued three times. And the first time I got sued, it was really hard. But the thing is, like, the second time I got sued, I was like, shit, man, everything's going to be okay. Third time, I'm like, yeah, no problems. It's the lawyer's job to handle this. <laughs> I mean, honestly, this is me being as honest, like, super, super bad with you, right? The quality that I think that has got me through most of these situations is perseverance, right? It's like, I am a cockroach. I have no issues. <laughs> I have no <laughs> issues calling myself that. I will get through anything. Like you can throw shit buckets at me and I'll find a way to get through them. No issues, right? You have to keep going forward. And when you talked about those entrepreneurs who have failed, you know, bless them, you know, I'm sorry to hear that, but it's also like they're learning is probably 10x of what I have. I mean, I have failed, but I have not lost everything my business is around me. And I know it's going to happen to me one fine day, 100%, right? I've just been riding this high wave and I can talk about all my successes, you know, like a casino at a poker table or whatever, right? And sometimes I will lose it. But the thing is, 
if we don't persevere, if we don't be disciplined, you know, things will change. I think discipline is another thing. I gave up drinking. Like two years ago, I just left the bottle and then all of a sudden my life came into place, which is essentially like I'm mentally stronger. I get up at 6, 7 a.m. every morning. I hit the gym that we were talking about earlier and I go cycling twice a week and, you know, I live right, life by routine and it's fantastic. My life is fantastic with discipline. So mental discipline and perseverance are the two qualities that I would give you of my life. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, no, I love the answer. I think a lot of people in the audience are like, yeah, whatever. There's probably something like really there because like a lot of people don't attach much to the mindset thing when really that is like the most important thing. Like my dad, he was a very successful real estate agent, which is very competitive. A lot of realtors out there, right? But he made it work. And he told me once uh, he got sued and I was like, oh my God, did we do something wrong? He's like, no, Greg, it's just... If you're successful, it's in this just game, America. <laughs> it's just like if you're successful, it's you're getting sued. <laughs> like, oh, it's yeah, going yeah. to happen. I mean, that, that, that's a, that's the cost of success. <laughs> like literally, like yeah. if you meet somebody in business who has not been sued, I have questions about the business. Yeah, like so you must not be making much. <laughs> Why are you not in court? <laughs> you're under the radar. But yeah, I remember. I think it was 16. Maybe I was 17, but. My dad only could fight it. And nowadays, everyone knows, but at the time, he only could fight it in me because we had a very close relationship. He got, not only was he getting sued, but his business partners stole a million dollars from us and they, uh. which broke the family basically. Like we had nothing. Like it was everything in this like development project my dad was doing. And I looked at my dad, like, why are you not more angry about this? He was like so calm about it. He's like, well, I mean, what's that going to get me? Like, I could enjoy my time with my son, talk about some stuff, or I can get really pissed off. Like, the second one doesn't really do anything for me. I was like, oh, wow. we can go have a beer. <laughs> yeah, or we can go to the Winchester, have a pint, and wait for yeah. it all to blow over. Don't you worry about it. Yeah. I mean, see, the, that's that's a, that that's an interesting man, right? Because oh, he got sure, hit. Yeah, he got hit with the biggest, let's say, slide of his life right there and then. Right? Somebody ran off with a mill. That's his year's life savings. He's got a family to feed. He's got all this other stuff behind him. And he was like, yeah, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. The roller coaster, man, that's a gentleman who's seen the roller coasters. So thank you. Oh, for, for that. sure, so, man. And like, I think he, like, I have a very good relationship with him. I always joke that, like, my dad's the nicest man in the world. I'm like an asshole version of him. So if you think I'm nice, just wait till you meet my dad. <laughs> like, he's like way <laughs> nicer. <laughs> so, like, it's, the, it's, so, the, it's the Alaskan in you, eh? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I agree with you on the perseverance thing, man. There's just so many ups and downs in the whole entrepreneurial career yeah. path, right? So as you grew Branzio and eventually, you know, you started seeing like the real true scale, what you can do, you did eventually branch out from that. So when was the right moment for you to branch out to other e-commerce stores? When did you start doing that? So the interesting part is this, right? When I, when, so I found myself in this lull. And that lull is what I thought I was burnt out. I didn't feel like I didn't have that same spring in my step every morning. I was like, oh, man, I'm just an autopilot. What the hell do I do? So I talked to a coach, right? I just talked to a coach, a business coach. He's built $3 billion businesses. And I said, look, man, what's going on here? And he said, you're not goddamn burnt out. He says, the one thing that you get excited about that in our chats is that you'd like acquisitions. And I said, oh, yeah, I do like growth. So he <laughs> recommended to me to, he said, your job is to go out and look at the trip. So there's three ways to grow, right? Number one is you look at acquisition, right? Which is you look at horizontal acquisition or vertical acquisition in your in your business. So for watches, it would have been something like men's fashion accessories, right? Or vertical could have been something along the lines of co-acquire a factory or watch strap company, et cetera, et cetera, right? Or you go and talk to your next competitor and you see, hey, what are the chances of you combining in a certain vertical and growing together. So if you have $20 million in sales, they have $30 million in sales. Do you do a share bonus plan exchange so that you sort of make that same sort of equivalent money that you did last year, but to combine you become a $50 million company. More interesting. So, so yeah, so I went through the phases of doing that. And what I found out was it was easier for me to acquire than combine for certain businesses. For this is the year that we're going to look at combining businesses because we've hit a certain scale. And the next step is we'll roll all these, not all 15 portfolios, we'll half of that portfolio we're going to roll under one brand. And then we're going to go combine with a larger group. Yeah. So by so combining that, and integrating one brand correct. into the other. Yeah. Because you can use so much stuff that's common. I mean, the way we've been successful as aggregators, is, of <laughs> course, number one, same operation, same marketing, same designers, same media buying. So, 
why can't I go to a bigger competitor of mine and say, hey, man, look, we know what you do. We do some things better, but we know that you do X, Y, Z things much better than us. So why don't we just combine, play to our strengths and, you know, combine to make like an $80 million consortium and then perhaps corner the market in certain segments and then go to the next level. So these are things I've never thought about. Coach ain't cheap, but coach is worth it. So that's how I started. Right. So the acquisition started, you know, first acquisition was 150K, scaled it to a million dollars at the end of the year. Second acquisition was probably like 300K, scaled it to like a million and a half. So it grows up. And of course, with that, the risk appetite also increases. You know, it's like you're playing a cra- at a craps table. You only sure, heard sure, about sure. the 15 successful ones. Let me tell you about the 30 unsuccessful ones <laughs> where I've lost money. <laughs> Right, yeah, yeah. But the thing is, I can come to this podcast and make myself being, you know, beat my chest and be like, hey, man, I'm the best. But it's not. It's uh, Let me tell you about the 30 unsuccessful ones where perhaps your audience might learn from, right? It's like... Ah, but uh, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie, yeah. the best always talk about the failures. So you're doing reverse psychology right now. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, don't know. I don't know. It's not the best, but it's also one of those things where I would say mistakes are made. Being too trusting, not doing my due diligence. The failures all come from me and my need for control. It's only when I started giving away control and hired people who are actually specialists in the field that I all of a sudden get successful, believe it or not. (laughs) Because I thought I could do it. And I'd read too many tech pro books about this. It's like, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to have the due diligence. Don't you worry about it. We're going to go in. We're going to scale this hockey stick growth curve. It doesn't work like that. You need an M&A banker. You need an M&A lawyer. These guys, they do this for a living. They've got their 10,000 hours. They do cost you a little more. They're going to cost you $500 an hour. And the thing is, in our mentalities of where we are, we tend to cheap out on that. So pay a man or pay a woman for what they're worth. Pay them for what they're worth. Pay your lawyers for what they're worth. Pay your accountants for what they're worth. Pay your M&A guys for what they're worth, right? Don't ask those questions. Just pay them for what they're worth. And do not try and shortcut that kind of stuff, right? People in e-com businesses like to pay valuators to get a bigger ego boost. Because we think that our business is the most valuable business. If And usually, for when I hear that, and if people are truly, as I say, they believe in that multiple, then we put into place earnout for them, right? Which Empire Flippers probably does, it works on as yeah, well. So 100%. it's like, if you think your business, you, know, you can scale this business to $6 million, and you want a 4x earnout, a 4x multiple instead of a 3x, which I think is fair, then sure, we'll give you 4x. But you know, show us that you can do it. So we'll give you 50% upfront in cash. This, this, is why we always, this is why we always advise sellers not to sell on potential because this is how the buyer like, oh, really? Well, how about we do this longer or not? I am that buyer. I will be honest. I am that buyer yeah. because if you think you have that, I mean, it's, it's simple, man. It's like, it's a very simple deal. It's like, now let me tell you about where market valuation, I'd love to hear about market valuations from you. That COVID bump has gone where I had put a few websites of mine for sale and, you know, I was getting a good solid 8x multiple for sale. And then all of a sudden, you know, January happened and then, you know, people couldn't find the funding, the line of credit and everything yeah. else. So it's like, okay, well, see, I eight figures. But then, <laughs> yeah, but that give you an opportunity to go to end 2022, you know, double off sales at what we've done in 2021. And now we're looking at combining to be a much bigger company, which is interesting, right? Now, the market as it stands today for folks like us is very interesting because I can actually go and buy businesses at 29, 20, 20 multiples, which is where the market should have been in the first place. In fact, yeah. it's going to drop even further because there's a soft recession coming, which everybody talks about. So, right. you know, I'd love to hear from you. Like, what are you guys seeing? Are you seeing more action on the Empire Flipper side or like, what is it? Yeah. So it's interesting, man. With us, like, we do well during down markets and during up markets, right? Because as long as the rules are set, there are people investing, there are people that are selling. But the moments of uncertainty, like go back to COVID, like obviously that turned out to be a great boon for everyone in our industry for the most part in terms yeah. of like soaring e-commerce and traffic. But at the beginning, no one knew, right? And that uncertainty yeah. paused everything. So we had... I think the worst quarter we've ever had in the history of our company was at the start of COVID. And then the next like, two years, two. the best years ever. But ah. uh, yeah, <laughs> so like one quarter, absolute worst. But the rest of the year made that year still our best year ever because of 
you know, just what happened. So right now, I feel like we're still in this place of uncertainty. So we're not doing super hot in terms of deal flow. Well, that's not true. In deal flow, we're doing well, but the buyers are still hesitant because they're similar to you thinking things are going to fall. And I think that's probably true. I think valuations will fall. I don't think it's going to be like business valuations don't fall like stock market prices, right? It's usually a gradual descent. Or watches, man. Trust me, the luxury watch market, something was costing half a million dollars now costs half its price. So right. never yeah. buy watches. Yeah. <laughs> it's called passion, so, so it's called so passion investing. <laughs> that's why you but buy yeah, a hundred dollar so... watch. Shit, that's not going to fall to $50. Right, right. But yeah, so overall, I think you're probably right. I think with the soft recession coming, I think we haven't even really truly felt the recession, like all the global issues that are happening right now. I think they're on a lag in terms of the economic turmoil that's coming. So I think valuations will fall probably back down to 2019 level, maybe a little bit below 2019. But with that said, I think the long growth curve of valuations will get a back above 2019, probably in a couple of years. Yeah, after look, everybody is done. looking at bootstrap yeah. companies, right? And then the interesting part is like most guys like us, we run bootstrap companies. Like what is bootstrap? Bootstrap is like this thing, which means like day one, we've been operating like with cash in the bank because yeah. we have to, we have to live on cash. It's like, that's the thing that feeds our hand, feeds our tummy. So this thing about people going to raise venture capital and all these books and everything else, they're just, that's what I say. Tech books are extremely misleading. Oh man, we raised $10 million at a $200 million valuation, oh, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, get out of here. I, when I was in San Francisco at Saster, I met so many people like that. And it's just like, man, I am not impressed. Like I know digital nomads who are running like, you know, low seven, mid seven figure businesses are making more money than you personally. Like they're building actual wealth. You got a loan basically, right? Like, like I'm not, I'm not terribly impressed with this like growth at all costs mindset that people have. Yeah. Like I have had friends that have exited on our platform for say yeah. eight, $12 million that yeah. made more money in that exit than people I know in the VC space that sold their company for 50, 80 million because of all the debt dilution, all the capital yeah, allocation, yeah. all that kind of stuff, right? So I think the entrepreneurial dream of getting VC is laden with myths and lies and just like, yeah, it's not I as good as you think do that. I've never thought, <laughs> I just don't understand it, man. It's just because we read these books and these books have, have story fair tale, the Elon Musk of the world who are getting great valuations and all that. It's like, it don't make sense. It don't make yeah. sense at all. It's 100%. like, who is the, you know, who is the winner? What is happening here? Anyway. Yeah, we're obviously in agreement there, but I want to move into managing your companies, but real quick. So with the sure. aggregator model you're doing, are you raising capital as well? Like a lot of the aggregators did, or are you just using your Zero. bootstrap? Mm -hmm. I just, it's I all just you. use my, it's all me. Oh, you're a man it's after my me. own heart. That's beautiful. Oh yeah. yeah. No, no, we, we, we bootstrapped it, man. Everything. So that's why I said we grew from a hundred to 250 to 350, you know, took losses along the way. You know, and it's kind of like, you know, it's not a hockey stick curve, which people think it is. It's kind of like, you know, it grows slowly, then there's a dip, then it slowly grows, then there's a dip, Values there's a further dip. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the thing is, some years it's like a double dip, and you're kind of like, okay, I started the year off, and I ended the year off at a break even. In my case, if a business I buy at the beginning of the year, and by the end of the first year, they still break even, and if there's a 15% growth in the second year, and 25% growth in the third year, I consider myself a successful I don't expect yeah. 100, 200, 300 percent growth as success. Even our so, bigger websites, our biggest website, Brandio, has about sixteen it's funny million that, sales that. a year. So we intend to just grow by ten to twelve percent. We don't intend to grow by thirty percent. I love the fact that you have a more conservative growth targets there. The hockey stick graph, man. Like me as a marketer, every time I do our yeah. quarterly report or look at our numbers, like. I will look at our email subscribers and I see other people's email subscribers and obviously they're getting less than us, but the screenshot looks so sexy with the hockey stick growth. No, and ours is just like does. this very gradual ski slope. In fact, if you just look at it like in a three month period, our emails look kind of flat, but then if you yeah. like go out, you zoom out by a couple of years, it's just as like slow and steady SEO organic That's subscribers it. Yeah, coming man. in. <laughs> like every <laughs> single month compounding over the time. Like, oh wow, this is actually huge. <laughs> You know, I don't know what sort of listeners you have, but like, I mean, I hate to sound like an old man, but consistency and just sticking to the plan is extremely important. People tend 100%. to forget that. People yeah. tend to forget that so much. And that's what I was talking about, the roller coaster fall there. It's like people forget about, and that's what I meant by discipline. 
discipline and consistency go so hand in hand. It's like my partner, my better half loves that, right? She's like, I know what time you're going to wake up, what are you going to do, where you at? And she says, that gives me extreme comfort in who you are. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm like, I feel extremely comfortable doing the same shit. So it's like, it's not a problem. <laughs> Do the same yeah, but awesome. it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know, it's great. But to have that consistency and to have that level of discipline is something, you know, that's important in our lives. So I think I'm, it's the same thing as you, what you're talking about, the slow organic growth. Like nobody gives enough credit to the SEO guys that we know, right? It's like, imagine oh, working on a website. Imagine you don't know what new algo Google is going to drop and hit you, right? It's like, you don't know. Right. And your whole income is based on your portfolio of SEO websites. And all of a sudden, you know, you might Google does a review ranking and you've lost half of your business. But yep. these guys consistently generate the same amount of content every damn week on their website. They probably gain two pages. They probably lose two pages, but they're always consistent with that sort of solid organic growth. And of course, like you're talking about the email growth or your organic growth for Empire Flippers as a website. I'm sure it wasn't, you know, you're probably like a, 15 year success story in the making. <laughs> it's wild, dude. Like, I mean, you and I know a lot of paid media affiliate marketers from affiliate world and like the concept that you get free leads from something you made seven years ago is like, what? How? <laughs> dude, they, they just don't like, they don't get it. <laughs> no, 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 no. It doesn't work <laughs> like that, man. We still have blog posts, man, that I wrote in the first three months of my career at EF, which is almost seven years. April 4th will be seven years. And they still generate leads for us, like after all this time, you know, which is wild. But enough on that. I want to get back into what you're doing. So with the 15 e-commerce brands, talk to me how, yes, how you manage your time. Because most of my friends, regardless of their team, they seem to be able to handle about three projects that are like relatively yeah. big. And even that is like, bursting at the seams for them. So what are you doing here? Delegating. Extremely important. That's what I talked about earlier. It's like, there are people who are better than you. And I just believe in that. So about three years ago, three years ago, now, four years ago, four years ago, we hired a consultant who came in. We looked at a team. Let me preface. In 2018 or 2019, whatever year it is, I was working about a solid 80 to 90 hours a week. Burnt out. I was a guy who was always on his phone always doing all these, you know, it's like, man, drinking a beer, you know, getting stressed. It's still like, these are the nascent years, right? It's like at yeah. the fourth or fifth year of my business. So it's still interesting. And the guy comes in and he says, look, man, he says, you're running quite a large team here. Half of it is Canada, half of it is in the Philippines. Of course, I was a victim of the four hour work week thing. When I say a victim, it of course means I thought about starting my company in the Philippines. Whereas I never thought that diversifying away from the Philippines and Canada would have been my greatest strength. And I'll explain to you why. Because I realized that having only two pockets or two centers of excellence isn't where my company is going to go. If I were to truly be a remote company, I had to put a 24-7 operation in place. Right? So the guy comes up and he says, look, how many hours are you working? I said, man, 60, 80 hours. Like, what the hell do I do here? And he's like, look, first things first. We are going to lock you out of your Stripe accounts, your Slack, everything. He says, we are going to fire you for the company for two weeks. I was like, what? He's like, yep. Yeah. He says, you've got an addiction and your addiction is your company and your work. And he says, that's all, you know, this feeling of restlessness or whatever. And he says, when you come back in two weeks, I'll have a plan for you. I was like, holy shit, what is this guy? Is he, he's going to ruin me. He's going to take over my company. What is going on here? It's like one of those episodes of Suits. I'm having a hostile takeover. Who the hell's doing this crap? <laughs> anyway, trust in the process, right? Trust in the process. And I'm paying this guy about 30 or 40 grand for like six months. So trust me. I'm like, this is an expensive bet for me. And then two weeks in, he goes, he goes, we're going to get rid of your Canadian team, right? I'm like, what? He's like, yep, we're going to get rid of your, at that time I had a CEO, COO, get rid of them, get rid of your team lead in the Philippines, get rid of like some team leaders. I'm like, what is going on here, man? I'm like, I have actually like spent my life trying to build this team. What are you doing coming and doing it? And he basically says, the middle management you have is crap. He says, you don't know what you've done. And I had gone to lens to save a penny, right? So I was still in that founder's mindset. I was like, I can do it. I am the man. I can do everything by myself. No, it does not work like that. So when you talk about time management, I think this gentleman helped me put a solid middle management in place. So when we have 15 websites, they work in a super efficient way. Like, you know, the design team. So we always have them prioritized by revenue based on the revenue that each site makes. 
that gets a center of excellence. You know, part of our portfolio is on Shopify. So we have two developers working for time on Shopify. Part of our portfolio is on WooCommerce and Magento, which is PHP based. So we have two developers on that. At any given point of time, a part of two designers, three media buyers, customer service is probably the largest 25 customer service and operations, and then so on and so forth. So the way it works for us is essentially the more we expand, the managers get to call the shots on the website. I personally have made a lot of mistakes because I'm so close to the business in terms of making the wrong call. So the managers make the right call. If they need a second opinion, they can come to me, but I don't make any calls for any of the websites. To give away your power and to ask the right questions was the most important thing that I did over the last four years. I'm not involved in the day-to-day of my businesses as much. So I have like a framework I recently came up with. I've been calling it like the four horsemen of wealth. And it's like the four skills that can make yes. you truly wealthy. And it's coding, which I think is actually the weakest of the four horsemen because of all the tools are coming out and how many coders are out yeah. there. Then it's sales and then marketing, yeah. my personal favorite. But the real yeah. one that is like the most powerful in my view is delegation. Because like that's how you move worlds if you can figure out the system of delegating. So Talk to me about what was the issue with the old management team that the coach told you, like, this has got to go. What did you do and how did you find those new people that came in? Well, they basically get this gentleman went and hired these new people for me. For example, oh, well, that's for, convenient. For, <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> yeah, it worked out. I, it was included in his fee. I was like, sweet. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, it's very hard to fire a CEO who's just had twins, who's one of your best yeah. mates. A week after no, he's had cool. twins. So trust me, it wasn't easy. And I had to yeah. do it. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life. But you have to make those calls. You have to make those calls because this is how it affects your business. What did it teach me? There's a few life lessons here. We found out three things. Number one, our team leaders and the person who led our team in the Philippines were dicking us over, right? So smart people, so smart that they had hired subcontractors to do their work for them while they drank and smoked at home. So it was somebody we were paying a thousand dollars to that subcontracted themselves. So they're four hour dollars. work week in your business. <laughs> yeah, they, I, I thought I was four hour work week in my business, but they the were four tables hour have work turned. Week. <laughs> yeah, the tables have turned, man. They were smart. And then the CEO, like, you know, for whatever he was, he was a great guy. And I still have nothing but nice things to say about him. But I think his goals were different in life. His goals were different in the sense that he was happy coasting and I wasn't happy coasting. I wanted to grow, right? And I wanted to grow. At that point in time, pretty aggressively. And he didn't, look, this is going to happen in your business a few times. You're going to outgrow the people that you have worked with. So what has gotten you here, when you go to the next level of business, those people are not going to help you take you to the next level. And it's a good thank you. It's a nice goodbye. And it's like, thank you for your service. We appreciate you. But in order to grow, we need somebody more. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I think almost. that works both ways too. I think the employees can outgrow or the business guy will grow the employees for sure in a startup when things are yeah. moving so hectic and fast. And employees can outgrow uh, company too, man. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think that's the thing. I was that employee. Think about. I was that employee. So I definitely know. So when people are saying, look, <laughs> I have employees who come to me and they say, look, we've got a visa to go to Australia. We've got a visa to go to study or like to the US or we've got something in Canada. Can you write us a letter of support? You're a Canadian company or whatever. I have zero issues writing them one. I write them a letter of recommendation. I'll do anything that's possible to get them there. Some people like think about it like, why would you do that? Why are you going to lose out on a good employee? But I'm like, dude, I'm an immigrant. I know how it changed my life. Why <laughs> yeah. won't I help change somebody else's life? If they want a letter of recommendation, if they want X, Y, Z, I'm going to do everything for them. It's the right thing to do, right? Yeah. yeah, you can't live your life by sort of keeping your cards close to your chest. I learned that the day I started giving, the day I started being transparent and an open book is the day my life changed. I love it. So you went from 80, 90 hours a week to now delegating. Like, What does your life look now with 15 brands? Like, Walk me through a bit of a typical week for you. Doing podcasts with Greg. <laughs> for 80 hours a week, by the way. For all the listeners well, out do, there, you I don't do, know I this. Do. But we're doing 12-hour day of podcasts with Ronnie. We're just not publishing. <laughs> <laughs> what did my life change to? My life changed to being a more balanced lifestyle, man. Like, I met the woman of my dreams, man. I'm going to end up marrying this girl one fine day. And it's never happened to me before, right? I've spent, I get to spend some time on that. Learning, connecting with people, spending a lot of time improving myself. So when I talk about self-care, it's like, you know, spending at least an hour and a half in the gym every morning, going cycling for a couple of hours a week or reading. I'd like to say I read, but that'd be lying, you know, maybe like 15, 20 minutes. Until let's say it's a good book, 
right? I think I'm done with the nonfiction aspect of it. The tech bro books just bored the shit out of me. So I'm like, kind of like still recovering <laughs> from that. So I found this new genre of books, which is financial crime. So like, you know, uh, yes. uh, Mike, yeah, yeah. So like the old, the liar's poker, you know, that kind of stuff. Liar's poker, Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham, Serpent on the Rock. Jolo and the billion dollar whale, like that kind of stuff. That kind of gives me like some hope that there's some good reading out there. Or I don't, you know, I don't <laughs> well, know, as, man. It's like it sounds as weird. a writer and voracious reader. That, let me assure you, there's a lot of good stuff out there. <laughs> yeah, I know. I have to find it, man. But your sort of reading is a little bit over my head, so I'll stick to the stuff that I like. <laughs> hey, uh, I, I I have a lot of different reading interests, man. It's not just the grim, dark fantasy. I read all sorts of stuff. <laughs> true. Yeah, and I think I've become a connector. Like, I was always a connector. But the connector is sort of different now, right? It's like because the kind of people that I'm surrounded by in Bangkok and Southeast Asia, it's sort of, I'm not only focused on e-commerce. I've started going into retail and other businesses. So there's a lot of opportunities out there that interest me a lot more than just e-commerce. So, for example, you know, working on infrastructure projects in the cell phone tower space, that's what we're getting into. So... That involves raising money. I'm just a minority stakeholder, but getting one of the big infrastructure venture funds like Macquarie or somebody else to invest, you know, 50 to $100 million so that you can grow with them is interesting to me now. But they're all these things, man. My life started in e-commerce, but I think like as an entrepreneur, it's evolving. That It's a fairly evolving thing. Like I'd like to tell you that, you know, I'm growing and I'm doing all these like fun things, but my sort of path of growth is changing a little bit from being online only to more sort of, offline and then maybe it'll come back online i don't know yeah i I love that man it's almost like a holistic evolution right like all the online skills you've learned will probably seriously help you in the offline world too even if it is something like an infrastructure project or whatever because i I find a lot of the offline stuff they have no idea how to do any of the online things i have friends they bought like you know, the smaller examples, but like made cleaning companies and they just took off like a rocket ship with the SEO and paid ads. Cause like the original owners of those companies have no idea how to do that stuff. They're like, what, yeah. what is this? We're not advertising with like cards at the local grocery store. Like what's going on? No. <laughs> but somehow those cards well, are going to come back. It's like the post pilot yeah. guy, man. The hottest new thing in the U S and the e-com business is people are now using postcard marketing again. I'm like, wow, who thought about it? <laughs> I actually am a big fan of postcard marketing, but we were coming near the end. I want to ask, make sure I ask these two questions before we get into the rapid sure. fire questions. So with your new superpower unlock with delegation, talk to me about hiring the right person. I know you had the coach initially that helped you, but now with 15 brands, I'm sure you're doing a lot of it yourself. I don't, uh, I don't hire. Teams do I don't hire. No, you have, I don't. A t- you have a I person hire. specifically to hire. I have, I have a HR person whose specific job is to go and hire people. Because I realized my biggest fallacy since I've started this company is I am not a good judge of people. <laughs> Believe it or not. Obviously, we're friends. Like, man, you really I know, this but, I'm, <laughs> but I'm too trusting. Okay, so number one is I'm too trusting of people, right? And number two, sometimes I just find it really hard to give people like set these boxed goals for people and be like, where are we at on this week about that? Where are we at this week on so-and-so? Where are we at this week on so-and-so? So I don't do it anymore. I give people a rough framework, then the managers take it, they compound it, they put it on an Excel sheet, and then they run with it. I can't really come and chase you every day with it, right? Because I feel, if you're going to wait doing it, I feel like a dad, you know what I mean? I'm a, could be like a disappointed dad if you don't complete what you've done. <laughs> so we have a HR person. We've got a two-person HR team. One person goes and recruits, one person interviews, then if they think this person is good somewhat, then they send them to me and then I just have a chit-chat with them and that's it. Or they, there's three levels of interviews, right? It's like, so we'll hire slow, like hire fire fast, probably heard about that, but it's like, yep. but they'll probably go through like three rounds of interviews, one test for skill, right? We have an aptitude test as well for the personality type, like 16 personalities or whatever there is. And then after we, they've done all that sort of homework, which takes about a month, then it comes to me and then I say, hey, you know, depending on the seniority, right? So if it's somebody in customer service, I don't need to be involved. If it's somebody in the management team, I'm definitely involved. If it's somebody on the ad side, I like to be involved because my background's in PPC. So I kind of feel interested mm-hmm. in it still. If it's designer, don't give a shit. So depends on the function. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel you on that. It's, I it's delegated on it, man. This is another example of delegation. I just said, look, man, I just outsourced it. I said, look, I'm not good at it. You guys take care of it. So, so is your is your recruiter always recruiting or like are you always looking for we are always recruiting. Like, 
always, always okay. recruiting. Yeah, it's a good way to upgrade talent, right? Right now, it's a good yeah, time. Yeah. But that's the interesting thing. So I was put into my place by my recruiter. They said, you think this is a good time to recruit? I'm like, yeah. Be like, you know, the bottom 20% of these companies are the ones who are getting, being let go. It's not the top 20. It's the bottom 20. <laughs> so think about that. This is all the COVID fact that they've gained. So I'm like, wow. You just blew my yeah, mind. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah, so she's saying the bottom 20% of the top tech companies are the ones letting everyone yeah. go? Yeah, exactly. So it's like, do you want the bottom feeders? Let me ask you. Yes. That's that's, course, that's right. a fair question. I mean, it's like, <laughs> uh, my perception, my perception was challenged. So uh, no, that, I would that's say... That's smart. I wouldn't have realized that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes your gift, like, I think I'm lucky that I'm surrounded by folks like you and you know, folks in my life who like to challenge the way I think. And I'm like, okay, that's fair. Never thought about <laughs> it. But you know what? You're right. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the big things about being an entrepreneur. I feel you be willing to be challenged and be willing to be wrong so you can be successful. Like you can either be right or successful, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that, that whole line. Yeah. Okay, so you delegated out the hiring stuff, which I think is super smart. Most entrepreneurs do not do that because like you said, they have the fallacy, oh, I can handle this. It's like, what do you mean you can handle this? You've never done this before. How do you know? Nah, <laughs> like, you know like, <laughs> nah just, just don't give up. Yeah. Read a book or two right. or maybe take that time to hire somebody who's actually better than you. I'm telling <laughs> you this again. If you've heard this podcast, there's one thing I'm going to leave you with. Hire people who've done this and you know do this for a living. They have a job for that. Like, it's like literally 10,000 hours. They've done their 10,000 right. hours. Pay the person always, what they're worth. Don't cut corners. I always joke with entrepreneurs Sorry. that when they ask me, like, how do I become a, you know, how do I get a bigger exit? I always tell them, you need to become more useless. And they're like, what do you mean? Like, yeah. like, you should not be the driving force behind your company if you want to sell it for the maximum multiple. There should be, like, teams. There should be systems. Like, you should be the most useless player on the team. And if Correct. that's true, it's a, plug a and buyer play. is going to love you. <laughs> It's a plug and play thing, man. Like, for example, like some of the companies that we buy, if I see that this person's only working 10 hours or less a week, I'm like, perfect. This is the guy we're going after because you can just take that model and fit it into your business. No issues. Right. So final question before the rapid fire section, how do you manage the team in terms of systems? Are you guys using like a complex Asana setup, Notion, something like that? Like, is there any tools you recommend for helping? Yeah, Trello. We've got Trello, we've got Asana and we've got Notion. The developers prefer Trello. We use Notion. I'll be honest, like I'll let you know a little secret. I actually don't use any of them. This is how useless I am in the company. <laughs> Good I'm, man, I'm extremely, my man. Yeah, yeah, it's not me. It's like, you want an honest question? I can give you my, you know, uh, this is what we use. No, we don't. Like, I know we use Trello. I know we use Asana and we use a couple of other ones. Am I in there every day? No. My pulse of the business is, there's a massive sheet. It's called the profit and loss sheet. And every day, we check in, I check in how much money we've made and you know, what's making money, what's not making money, where the money is being made, where the money isn't being made. And that is what I need to look at on a daily basis. And if I see certain things going wrong, then we have a chat with my managers and we make sure it happens. We course correct immediately. And then that's it. I love it. All right, man. Yeah. Well, we're at the end of the podcast. There's three sure. rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Shoot. I am always All ready. Right. All right, my man. All right. What is the best hidden growth opportunities within e-commerce today in your view? Influencers. Always bet bet once, bet twice, bet thrice. Influencers. <laughs> Love it. What are the tools or resources that people can use to maintain or grow their e-commerce business that you found super helpful? Oh, well, there's a couple of guys. You know, there's this guy, Nick Sharma, who we met in Bangkok. He's an extremely, extremely smart guy. He runs a newsletter for e-commerce and DTC. I think you should subscribe to his. Chase Diamond's another one. I definitely recommend him. There's a few other guys out there, but these are the two guys who come to my head. So Empire Flippers, I know that you guys have a definitely have quite an extensive library for e-commerce related content as well. Would highly recommend that. So it's definitely a no bias on the EF side there. Pretty good stuff over there, I've heard. I know, but I've read it. The thing is, Greg, actually, I'll let you know a little secret. Good old Greg's written a few of those blogs. <laughs> definitely visit mine please then opt in and buy a business so hubspot then opt in and buy a business i owe you, so I owe you hubspot knows that it's converting <laughs> all right my final and hardest question for you my friend what has been your funniest moment working in the e-commerce industry the funnest or the funniest funniest but i guess it could be bad if you don't have a funny moment <laughs> i don't know man i think it has to go to Chiang Mai seo like literally Chiang Mai seo 
where I think we met for the first time in DCBKK or Chiang Mai SEO. I, yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't it was, I'm pretty sure it was Chiang Mai SEO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so us. yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's an interesting one, right? That's where my journey, like, sort of like in the digital nomad space started. And it's like, I think that was, was that the time? I don't, so maybe I'd done DCBKK before and then I ended up at Chiang Mai SEO. First time doing this whole digital nomad thing. This was about seven years ago because you just started at Empire Flippers then, right? Seven or eight. And then, End up at this conference with a bunch of dudes on SEO, and I was like, what is going on? Who are these people? And everybody's like serious. And I'm like, I don't know what SEO is, you know, trying to like <laughs> leaf through brochures, trying to figure it out. And then after the sunset in Chiang Mai, you know, mayhem. It is plain mayhem. Like everybody's got their shirts off. People are breaking hands. You know, <laughs> we can't name who, but we know who. People's feet are broken. I'm like, what is going on, man? Who are these people? I'm like, I love them so much, whoever these people are. I, I remember specifically the man we won't name who climbed the wall and broke his arm. And the first thing he did at the club after he broke his arm was order a beer before going to the hospital. <laughs> like, what? what? <laughs> SEOs, they know how to party better than any other type of uh, partner out there, man. They, they always you are know the most what, man? social groups on Facebook. I They're know. Always arguing. My favorite... <laughs> my favorite people like you know i've sort of done the whole loop around the e-commerce thing and digital marketers and all that and somehow that's the reason perhaps i feel like Chiang Mai is home because there's a big community there of the of the seo folks and i feel like they're a very tight-knit crew and they are certainly very open you know when that when we talked about that giving scale earlier this crew yeah. that we have that or at least that i know i'm lucky to know is like pretty good at that yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel it's almost like a superpower living out here and being connected with those guys and just a lot of the entrepreneurs in our space. Like, because if you need help, like, hey, how do I oh, do yeah, this? Yeah. Like, oh, here's like Five a minutes. giant 5,000 word customized like message to you on how to do it. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, you. five minutes. <laughs> I will I will put my name down on a piece of paper and say, you know, that these guys won't help you. So we are lucky. We are lucky that you sure. know, we have such a good group of people around us. Absolutely. Well, my friend, we're at the end of the podcast. If someone wanted to connect with you and ask you more about Brandsio or your other e-commerce brands or just connect with you in general, where's the best place for them to go? Well, LinkedIn's good. It's Ronnie Teja, R-O-N-N-I-E-T-E-J-A. Or you can get to me on Twitter. It's Roaring Ronnie, which is R-O-A-R-I-N-G, R-O-N-N-Y. Yeah. Easy peasy. Excellent. And a bonus yeah. tip, if you do connect with Ronnie on LinkedIn, you will see me probably trolling him at one point on LinkedIn because that's what I use. Always. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What are friends for? <laughs> right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it, buddy. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it got you inspired at all the different things that are happening in this industry. And of course, if you just want to buy a highly profitable business, you can always go to empireflippers.com slash marketplace, or maybe you want to make an exit of your highly profitable business, and you could go to empireflippers.com slash sell your site. I've been your host, Greg. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review, give us a like, a follow, share it across social media. Talk to you all soon. See you on the next episode.